Okay, so this talk is called Gat Got Your Tongue, and it's about a utility I wrote for work for managing lots of files and keeping them outside instead of subversion. Don't ask about the subversion part. Why subversion? That's outside the minute talk. Git! No, actually, I mean, we, the Git, yeah, yeah. So in the beginning, there was the Spam Code project. And the Spam Code project has lots of data. Um, it's really not much of a coding project. It's more of a HTML with benefits project. So this this is pretty much what the code looks like. That's the code. Um, and well, there's lots of other stuff in it though. There's big, big amounts of static content. Uh, it's written in JSP, but this, which is the part that we want to version control. But there's also lots of static content that is large binary files, which the version deals with. Well, it can, I'm told by certain people that it can do with these quite well, but in our situation, S, H, um, subversion over HTTP over SSL, it works really, really poorly. So, we have these assets in SVN on a box with about a gig and a half of RAM, uh, and it kills SVN. It kills SVN so much that like last year or so, the common conversation was uh, night, morning, and evening, Dylan, the SVN server's down again. Dylan, hey Dylan, the SVN server's down. Why does the SVN server keep going down? So Stephen wrote a solution to this in which he um, detailed the files. And by the way, this is pretty much what the content of the spam <laughs> website is. There's like one meg of code. So Stephen wrote a solution to this in which he has a YAML file that describes all the static content, um, the, the, the FLDs and so on. And he had a script that removed them from this and that you can do an SVN commit and add new directories without adding files and so on. And then he asked me to enhance this. So I did the, the awesome thing, enhance it. And this is how I enhanced Stephen's code. I did not generate an YAML file because I think I had a deadline and like something else to do. So what I did is I wrote some shell one-liners. What this, uh, back up, back space. So I wrote a shell one-liner, um, which basically I found all the files that were JPEGs. Actually, that was like a huge net. The reason there's some parentheses there is it's like an or statement. By the way, I know that someone's going to point this out and say that's not valid in my shell. When the shell sees fine, it doesn't uh, do wildcard expansion. So this is actually valid in my shell. Anywho, so I found all the JPEGs, the FLDs, the MP3s, so on and so forth, and put them in it and run MP5 some on them. Who here knows what an MP5 some file looks like? Good, most of you. But if you don't, it's an MP5 hash sum, two spaces, and then the file name. So we run a set script to um, do shell escaping on this and print them. And then we actually use off to gen generate a bash script and then run it through bash. Then we add all, this basically puts all of them in a dot asset directory identified by their hash sum. And then we add them. And then we run the rever inverse of that to add them back in, which means that all the files that we want are in subversion and all the big huge files are not. This has a side effect of, because I'm running, I'm using replacing them with similar, I'm compressing them because spam, the Spamco website has like one gig worth of duplicate files. So, um, it's not on, actually on the slides, there's no slides for this, but so I thought this was kind of an insane solution. It was a sort of one time thing, I thought it was just going to be used a little bit, but then Nick ended up working on this, and Nick said something that surprised me because normally he's very pessimistic and hates everything. He said it was great. And I think, okay, well you think it's great, and this, you know, with this boy, I had a single user that liked something I, that I had written in the, in the crappy shell scripts, I'm like, well, I've got to write this better. I've got to write this properly. Probably not as a shell script. And I'm going to optimize this. Because obviously the shell script was a highly optimized solution, right? So I'm going to optimize this. Um, one more. Uh, but premature optimization is evil. However, what I'm talking about by optimizing it was, uh, of course, I'm going to optimize this so I can have the most fun doing it. Uh, so to optimize for fun. I don't know why that's repeated. I want to use KyokuDB at work. I've gotten to use KyokuDB a couple of times. Most of the deal with my SQL. Um, um, my coworker wrote KyokuDB. Well, he's one of the people that was working on KyokuDB, and he got to work on it. But I haven't got to work on those projects, which I'm actually kind of grateful for, for other reasons. So I want to use KyokuDB, KyokuDB model. 
using Berkeley DB. Um, breadboard, I got to use breadboard, so I was like, oh, I'm going to use breadboard for this. And it goes without saying I'm going to use Moose because uh, it's going to be all of so. <coughs> What I did is, the first thing I wanted to do is model this. I wanted to take that stupid flat file that I have to parse over repeatedly and define a schema for it. Then on top of the schema is a model to control the operations over the data. Then all the nasty file system operations, so maybe we can port this to Windows at some point. And then wrapping it all up in some sort of an API, and on top of an API right in the CLI. Uh, the reason I have an API layer is so that I can someday put a GUI on this or anything like that. So this is my database schema, which is a Moose class with many labels. A asset is a file. Oh, back one. Uh, an asset is uh, has many labels. Those are the file names. Um, it has a size, which I recorded just for some checksumming, uh, because if the MD5 sum has changed and the file size has changed, something weird has happened. Or has it changed in that? Anyway, um, so that's the most basic unit. The next we have the label which is the file name pointing back to the asset, which is a loop reference. So as you can see, uh, you have a single asset, which is a checksum, which can be referenced by multiple file names. And this basically represents the output that you would see in an MD5 sum file, except with a file size information. Uh, since I'm now officially over time because this talk started late, but uh, OK. So the model, what does the model do? The uh, model has the first function is the add label, which associates a file name with a checksum and the size. The next method is to look up that label, which returns the object so that I can get out the checksum and the size from it. Then, same thing for assets. Let me over here, so I think it's actually outside the camera, but that's okay. Floating ahead. Um, to remove the label from the database and to remove the asset from the database. This method doesn't actually exist because I only thought of this while writing the slides. This method doesn't exist currently. But anyway, the repository, these are the nasty operations on the file system, which is probably the single bulk of the code, because it, keeping track of symlinks and core hard links is not entirely fun. So we can store a file. This returns the checksum of the file, which we then can pass into the other layer of the database to store it. Then we have the fetch function, which uh, returns, actually copies the file or hard links the file out of the database so that um, you can manipulate or you can undo it and decide you don't want this to be managed by the asset management system. Attach actually creates either a symlink or a hard link, and it's what it's called when you are after you add the file. So a typical operation when you add a file would be to store it in the asset directory, which is what this does in the repository, and then to attach it to a symlink. And somewhere you have to put it in the database because otherwise you'll have no record of this association. Um, the opposite of this is detach. Detach will not delete a file. Detach only delete, well, delete, detach deletes a file, but only if the file was attached. Uh, which is relatively easy if it's a symlink and it points to the same asset file with the checksum if it would, then you know it's the same file. And if it's a hard link, you can check the inode number. And if the inode numbers are the same, then it's the same file. And finally, remove, which could be hypothetically called by a garbage collection scheme uh, to remove any checksums that are in the asset directory but not referenced in the database. By default, I don't do this um, because the idea of this is the database is versioned along with SVN, and the files are not versioned. But their existence or non-existence and their names are versioned. And that's the end of the actual slides because I was running out of time. But the basic operations of this. It's really weird when commands don't have tag completion. Damn it. Um, ignore the live code demo. What this actually looks like in production. I can't do that. So anyway, we have this lovely command. Uh, what happens, the basic operations which are in the command line layer, which are built on top of these are add, which adds a file, which I already described subsequently. Remove, which removes the record from the database. It does not call remove on the store. And then there's hide and unhide. So the workflow for this, which we've actually been using, is roughly uh, gat add. It auto, it auto creates the directors. Gat add, bunch of files. Um, 
then running gat hide, which hides your files, you just add, do the subversion stuff, and then unhide them. So. Two questions. Yes. You're using subversion, but it's you get in the corner. Yep. What's up with that? Uh, we're not. I, we use Git for. Uh, that's my home directory, actually. And I'm using Git for this code. But I'm not using Git for the very large, mostly static content website. So the second question is: Is the new version faster? Of subversion? No, the new version of of the, the file management, the the one you built with Moose rather than the the one. The Moose version is significantly faster, uh, and mostly because it's constant time lookups against the database versus scanning this MD5 some file repeatedly. Uh, the basic bulk operations are the same speed, but looking up a file is much faster. Uh, looking up a file happens quite frequently when you're deciding if you're, when you run GAT out on a single file, you want to know if it's attached. That would be a linear, well, actually, L L LGN, because you have to do search through the sorted MD5 some file. So the performance increases uh, better. You still have most startup time, but that's like, as you saw, like two seconds before it died. So. Um, so, there's a significant portion of the people here are actually my, my co-workers. If any of them want to ask questions about how to use this tool or want to write a GUI, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Um, actually, I have some interesting details on how I'll write a GUI. Uh, this actually has a component called the, called a, has a daemon component that runs in Clack HTTP server, which furnishes JSON uh, requests so that you can actually start the daemon up on something and send requests to it so that I can write a GUI using .NET and have it run on Linux. Well, I'd like to see uh, at some point, like to see, is another feature, I know you did a workaround to update files, you know, like these large image or video mm -hmm. files, but uh, a more elegant method for doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, for transferring files, this is actually quite cool because <clears throat> The, some other code that I've been playing with is I can actually ask a remote repository. This is just like Git, really. This is Git without version control. It's only it's convergent evolution and ends up being that way. But I can actually ask a remote repository what checksums it does, what it has, and compare them to what I have, and only send those. So I have a very inter a bandwidth efficient way of sending change set, or not change sets, but sending assets between two boxes. But if a particular asset needs to be updated, because for the most part we're keeping out of the subversion because a lot of mm -hmm. these assets aren't updated. In the few cases oh. that we need to update an asset, when you update a file, uh, GAT automatically knows that it is no longer an attached file. So if you run add on it again, it will add it as a new entry, and the previous label will be removed. So um, you can just rerun add every time you add new files, and it will figure out which ones it already knew about versus which ones it shouldn't. It also has an exclusion list, so it can only pay attention to JPEGs, FLDs, and whatever. And then, and then the log when we grab the zip files of the client. Yeah. There's actually, I have a, actually a, a subcommand that doesn't work, but the command I used the other day to get files to Eric was Can you saw I've not been using, I've been using an external keyboard lately? Anyway. You see all that? Okay. So, uh, GAT has a list of fi uh, files command which lists all the files that it knows about. If you do null, it prints out a null terminated string, which XR then passes all of those to tar, thus creating a tarball that has all of the files uh, that are currently managed by GAP. And it, is there an option to only export the updated files? From a previous version, no, because it doesn't have any concept of version. It, theor it would be theoretically possible to do that. Um, you could possibly add a date flag to only give you files that are newer than a particular date. I think that would be a key feature considering Considering that we don't, considering this spam code does not use version control. Yes. See, this really matter. The whole thing with subversion is we really only care about our changes because their changes are come to us in the tarball. So. Yes. Is there any room for rsync in this process? Nick actually uses rsync for this. Nick's actually kind of. Uh, what he I think he's used rsync when SSHFS became too slow. What Nick likes to do with this is he actually abuses. The public API, because I have no API for this right now, but he takes and replaces the dot there because all the files are stored in the dot GAT directory. Like, so they're all stored in a directory like that, which is pretty much like the Git objects directory, which I co version evolution. Anyway, except there's this is not meant to do version control. Anyway, so all what Nick does is he replaces that directory with a symlink to a mounted SSHFS file system, so he never actually has these huge files on his laptop. 
Um, I, and he can pull up the web page in a testing environment and it just pulls in the files as he needs them over the SSH FS connection. So um, I basically, I think I might even use rsync to transfer the assets between different locations. Um, except I also want to support an S3 backend. I want to have it so that you can ask for checksums that you don't have from like an S3 bucket. Uh, and I actually have an API for that too. But I, I'm, I'm one of the two. Going back to talking about updating specific files, mm -hmm. if we can get it to work so that if you ask me an update, if you, if you add a file to your local repo in that, in that proper directory, mm -hmm. if we can get it to somehow add itself. You can add, can, does SPN support local pre-commits, so the code that's run on the local machine before you run commit? He's like a learning or working copy, I would imagine. I mean, but I mean, does it already have a hook that runs on your working copy? Because I don't know if it, I don't know if it does. Um, nevertheless, it could still be done that way. Because I mean, even if you're using, I think even if you're using Git, there's a point where you don't want to take. I actually know from experience, there's a point when you do not want large files in Git because we have another project I work on. We're using Git, and I have seventy, no, one hundred and seventy-six meg files that were CSVs. And especially if there's any operations that depend operations on those, Git's performance becomes truly abysmal. To, so much so that what we actually do is split these. We actually split these files into thousand line segments, and uh, load and, and concatenate them at the after we do a checkout. Um, so I might act, theoretically you can use that for something like that. Basically, any large data that's not really part of SVN. Yes. What's on your hair, Michael? Oh, your hair <laughs> it, It's because uh, uh, Git has to do an MD5 or an SHA1 patch on the, the file. Yeah, no, that's the reason um, I'm, what, about Git? Oh yeah, I don't know if it's because of that. I actually think it's the, the Delta, when it's sending the Deltas, because what happens is either the client, usually not the client, but usually the server runs out of RAM. It goes compressing objects, and it's uncompressing objects, and it's doing. It starts sending the packs, and at the point of sending the packs, I think a pack gets too large because I get oh, oh, I'm killer, killed your process. Blah, blah, blah. Um, Stephen is more familiar with this than I am. In fact. So. I know that Nick, both Nick and is Stephen here. And neither is Nick. Oh, they're my actual only two extent users of the software, but I guess that's why we're not here. Yeah. So this is that on GitHub? It is, it's on my GitHub, but it's, uh, I'm not used to conferences with internet, so I'll just write this. Actually, I don't remember, uh, no, I didn't remember GitHub. So. I'm Dylan WH, and the thing is named GAT. So the point yes. at which Dylan developed this, it made a huge difference because you were having substantial issues with large repositories. Oh, actually, Eric's a, technically Eric's a user of this, too. You, you've used this before, except before Eric's usage of this involved never actually executing the software, because I gave him a directory that he would upload files into, and then this ran on every minute. Uh, actually, the precursor is the precursor is that was written in shell is what he was actually using, but the file storage is roughly the same. The only difference is this is somewhat faster. Yeah, but it made a huge difference. Um, we started, we, I stopped getting phone calls about the version server being down. So. Uh, the most important thing that I took away, that to take away from this is that uh, deciding you're basing your tool set on how much fun you're going to have using it occasionally is a good idea. Because I pretty much did this on, this was pretty much a lark. We needed it for work, but it wasn't really that serious. Of a, of a need because the shell script, well, I the shell script and stuff. But anyway, it was it was mostly done for fun. Okay, so I'm done, and only 12 minutes over.